Sorry, guys. I was watching the commercial, but it's too long. It was a commercial that I couldn't hear anything. Igor, thank you. God bless you, brother. Floyd Mayweather, my brother from different mother. Don't be like any other. Uh, you can have a serious question. I'll open up my Skype in a minute after we finish praying, but I'm going to wait a few minutes because you know it's going to buffer, right? So are you praying in Jesus' name? The buffering <clears throat> goes away completely, but at least it's 99% better than before. So I'm expecting it to buffer, uh, but it's going to get better. You, you saw last time when it really buffered badly, then about 15 minutes it went away. <laughs> Okay, L-O-L-O-L. I don't know if that's a troll that's here or he's a brother in Christ, sister. I don't know. What's your question? What's your big question so you can get a big block if you're making fun? L-O-L-O-L-O. -O -O -O. Guys, I'm wearing my same same shirt I wore yesterday, Team Jesus. Right? Team Jesus. I got no muscles. I haven't hit the gym. Right? Team Jesus. How many guys saw the debate yesterday? No, I don't believe the rapture is uh, it's going to happen before the tribulation. I don't believe that. So, LOLOL, -L -L, I, I thought I recognized you, but that name's kind of thrown me off. You're kosher, right? You're a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ? Yeah, Ed, it's nothing I can do about it. When you guys say you didn't get notification, there's nothing I can do. Okay, brother, I don't know. Your name threw me off. I have no control over YouTube notification. But if you want to know when I'm going online... You got to get on my Facebook page. Ask me to add you because I announce on my Facebook pages, my own personal pages and the pages that were started by others. Answering Islam, which I, I can't have access to anymore. My Sam Shimon page and Zachary Knight running away, away from Sam Shimon. I announce there about an hour to two hours before I go live. So that's how you're going to find out. All right. Give me a I just got done saying I have no control over a notification. Sam, what are some hadiths that she has used because Sunnis use Bukhari Muslim? They have Kulaini and Kafi off the top of my head. I know some of their hadiths have been translated, but not all of them. So unfortunately, that puts us at a disadvantage if we don't read Arabic. I don't know, Black Smurf, if I'm even qualified to talk about the rapture. And even if I am, there's too many views on the rapture. Mine would be just one of many views. So what would you benefit from hearing my understanding of the rapture? Because I can be wrong. Run to Christ, Lord Jesus, bless you and bless, bless everyone. Not just you, but every one of you. And Lord Jesus, bless your family, your children, especially in the elderly. elderly. Lord Jesus, shield us by his blood. Wash us in the blood of the Lamb, the blood of Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus, wash us in his blood, purify us, cleanse us in his holy blood. We love you, Lord Jesus. And Lord, please forgive us because we don't love you the way we should, and we love you imperfectly. Help us, Lord Jesus, by the power of your Holy Spirit, by the life of your Holy Spirit, the eternal spirit of your Father, your spirit, <clears throat> the spirit that you share in union with the Father, the Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus, transform us by your spirit to conform to your image, Lord Jesus. To be more like you, Lord Jesus, in love, in compassion, in mercy, in pity, as well as in boldness and in passion, Lord Jesus. For you are the line of the tribe of Judah, but you were also a lamb led to the slaughter. Lord Jesus, increase in us, we beg you. Sit and throne upon our hearts, Lord Jesus, we beg you. And the hearts of our loved ones, my case, my daughters, these angels you gave me. Sit upon the thrones of their hearts, Lord Jesus. Seal us by your spirit. And again, we ask, shield us by your holy blood, Lord Jesus. You are almighty over creation. You are almighty over all diseases and the coronavirus. We submit to you. We trust in you. We love you. We cling to you. We fear you and not what the world fears, Lord Jesus. Lord, I ask that you bless these sessions. Bless us with strong internet connection. Bring people with attentive hearts, open ears. And loosen my tongue, Lord Jesus, to worship you, to glorify you, to love you, and serve you by serving your people, the body of Christ. Anoint me to speak truth without error. Save me from stammering and confusion, Lord Jesus, to recall and interpret scriptures correctly by the power of your Holy Spirit. And Lord Jesus, purify the motives of our hearts, that I do not prostitute myself for fame or money, Lord Jesus. Please 
please purify our, mo our motives, my motives, Lord, and save us from our sinful passions. You are worthy, Lord Jesus. You are worthy. Lord, we know you live. We know you are reality. You are truth. You are real. You're not make-believe. You truly live, Lord Jesus. You truly walk this earth. You sit enthroned in heaven. And you watch over us and you love us. And you will return physically to the earth. And until you do, I know, Lord Jesus, you'll give us the grace and the power from your Holy Spirit to face anything. Anything, Lord Jesus. And you'll give us the power to never deny you, to never betray you, to never shame you, Lord. Please, Lord, don't let us shame you. Let us be salt of the earth and light of the world, Lord Jesus. Lord, I say this on behalf of everyone here. They're not here for me. They're here because they trust in you, Lord Jesus, that you're raising up men and women, such as myself, to teach them your word. They're here for you, Lord Jesus, because they love you, Lord. <clears throat> We love you, Lord Jesus. We do, Lord. And I pray that you give us the grace to be your bold representatives, to show the world the difference between those who do not have Jesus and those who have Jesus. Lord, you are so beautiful. You are beauty itself. You are the Father's heart who became flesh. And Lord, even your name melts hearts, the name Jesus. In any language, Jesus, Yeshua, Ishu. <clears throat> The virgin born son of Mary. We love you, Lord. Please help us to love you the way you deserve to be loved. And Lord, please give us the grace to finish this race. I'm not asking to be saved from coronavirus because if we get it, it's your will and we'll bring you glory and we accept your will, whatever it is, because we know you'll give us the power if we get it or we don't get it, if we get cancer, if we don't get cancer. The most important thing to us, Lord, <clears throat> is to glorify you, to be in love with you, live for you, and even necessary to die for you, Lord. Please give us that grace that we never shame you, never shame you. Lord, we can't live without you. I can't live without you. You have been with me since I was a child. And you've been good to me, Lord. You've been get good to all of us, Lord. Forgive us when we fail you. Forgive us when we don't worship you and love you enough. And don't love others for your sake. And forgive us when we blame you for our own sins or for the evil of Satan. You are blameless, unblameworthy. You are blameless, you are innocent, you are pure, you are righteous, you are good, and you are beautiful. We love you, Lord Jesus. <clears throat> I love you, Lord. Bless this session, Lord. Bless it. And be with us, Lord Jesus. I love you. I love you, Master. We love you, Master. We love you. Lord, we love you. We've tasted and we've seen how good you are. I have tasted you. And I cannot live without you. None of us can live without you, Lord Jesus. And I'm not just saying this for my sake, on behalf of everyone. None of us can live without you. We can't. We can't do it, Lord. We can't do our life. Thank you, Son of God. Thank you, virgin-born Son of Mary. Thank you, Son of David. And as bl a blind Bartimaeus cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. Have mercy on me. We say, Jesus, son of David. Jesus, son of God. Jesus, virgin-born son of Mary. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on our children. Have mercy on our elderly. And forgive us, Lord. We love you. We love you. Ah, but we love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, that was not planned, right? The Lord purify my heart. I wasn't planning to break down, but sometimes it's kind of hard not to break down when you think of Jesus, right? And I pray the Lord will bring more people. We see 200 for his glory because I want more people here. <sighs> yeah. 
Yeah, sometimes just when you think about the Lord, right, you can't help fall in love with him because he's so beautiful. So it happens. It happens. Right. It happens. I just sometimes I sit and I'm going to open up the Skype so you can call me and I'll take questions in the text. Guys, I'm going to do a marathon today. Guess what? I plan, if God is pleased, to do three sessions today. Q&A. Then afterwards, afterwards, I'm going to do a session on Jesus being the God, the God of the patriarchs and the prophets to continue where I left off in the debate yesterday. And then, Lord willing, later tonight, I'm going to do a topic proving that Allah of the Quran is actually Baal, the false god Baal, that Islam is nothing more than the religion of Baal, Baal worship, Baal. So that's what I plan if God is pleased. And if you come and invite people, because I want to see the numbers go get higher for the glory of God. All right. So we're going to have, uh, because what else do we got to do? All the governments are saying, the states are saying, stay home. That's why I'm saying this is the time to be Jesus. If you know elderly, elderly, go out there and serve them. And I pray I practice what I preach. People that are afraid, go out there and comfort them with the love of Jesus. Right? Be Jesus to them. And let's, since we can't meet in church buildings, because churches are closing down, we're going to meet on social media, pray together, worship together, sing to the Lord. All right. Sorry, I said it's going to buffer. So we're going to wait. Don't worry. The buffering is going to go away. Usually it's like 10, 15 minutes of bad buffering, and then it's better. This is the time where we need to now fast more, pray more, worship more, study the Bible. Don't be lazy and idle or panic. Imagine the Lord has now given you time to live in a monastery. You're now living a monastic life. So now discipline yourself spiritually and do spiritual exercises, right? With me there? Study. Yeah. Okay. Now, with that said, this is going to be open to any questions. And then, Lord willing, the second session which I'll do maybe an hour, an hour, an hour after this one, we'll take a break, will be Jesus, the God of the patriarchs and the prophets. Jesus, the God of the patriarchs and the prophets. I'm going to use John to prove the point I was making yesterday in the debate. If you didn't watch it, we'll give you the links. That Jesus is He's my God. I hate when it buffers. It's okay. It's like I said, it's much better than it used to be. The Gospel of John identifies Jesus it's going to happen, like I said. Didn't I tell you? But it gets better. We just got to be patient. John identifies Jesus as Allah. Oh, boy. Every time I want to say that, it it's, it's spiritual warfare. John identifies Jesus as the God of the patriarchs and the prophets. Amen. I got it through. Yeah, I'm not on Wi-Fi, sinner. Why don't you get off your horse? I'm not on Wi-Fi, sinner. This is the Alzheimer's hour. Yeah, in fact, it, it does. Oh, 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 it does annoy me. You know when it buffers, I want to just shout and rage and cuss up a storm, so I can have more reasons to repent. Okay, all right. Let me open up. Let me open up the Skype. So this is time to ask questions, because I, I'm not here to do a topic. I'm here to answer questions, because I could have just went into the topic. So let me open up my Skype, and if you have questions, you can also text me if you're afraid to call. Do, do, do. And I got links to give you. Make sure I give you the links to some articles and podcasts. All right, open. All right, we're here. I'm open now. Got, uh, can you, uh, Ibn al Khan, if you call and you attack and you mock, I will block you and send you to Mecca. What's up, bro? Can you hear me? Did I hang up again? Sorry, I keep pressing. <laughs> Call again, man. I keep pressing the wrong button. What's up, bro? Hello. Hello, my friend. Hello. I, I'm Evil Khan. You're Evil Khan? Yeah. No, I, I'm an ex-Muslim. I oh. talked with you on Facebook. I became a Christian. And your vlogs... Those helped me very much. Ibn Khan, okay. I thought it's Mickey Afrada. Who's calling me now? Is that Ibnul or is it Mickey? Ibnul. 
Okay, why does it say Mickey? I don't know. My name is Ibnul Khamis in okay. Skype. My question is in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. It says that it is without faith, it is impossible to please God mm -hmm. because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So mm -hmm. my question is, uh, does God give grace to other believers, other faiths like Muslims or Hindus or Buddhists, how can they do good works without any grace of God? And I yeah, read I, an article about Vati in the Vatican II Catholic Catechism yeah, that I, they I, believe. Ibn al Khan, do me a favor. Don't quote me to Catechism, I'm not Catholic. So stick with the Bible. You can ask that to a Catholic. Why are you calling, quoting the Vatican to me? No, and they are interpreting that. So, yeah, but, but here's Ibn, listen, service. brother. Be patient, listen. I want you to listen. Okay. According to me, the documents of Vatican II carry no weight for me because I'm not Catholic. It carries weight for a Catholic, but not all Catholics. Uh, uh, by the way, don't quote to me a source external to the Bible because it's like you quoting to me Muhammad, the prophet. I don't care what a source outside the Bible says. Because I'm not Catholic, I don't submit to the authority of the papacy. And I'm not trying to attack Catholics here. That's the question you ask a Catholic, not a Protestant who doesn't believe in the papacy, the magisterium, and doesn't believe in the councils of the Roman Catholic Church. And it's not just me who don't believe it. You have Orthodox here listening who don't care what Vatican II says. And it's not attacking the Catholics. That's why they're Orthodox and that's why I'm Protestant. If I was Catholic, then I'd say, okay, tell me what Vatican II says. So okay. put that aside. Going back to Hebrews 11.6, what does Hebrews 11.6 have to do with other religious groups and their relationship to God? Be more specific. Like in Hebrews 11.6, is saying that those who seek God and believe he exists, that's why I'm saying And what does that, that mean if God rewards them? How does he reward them according to that chapter? Oh, that's my confusion. Does God reward them according to what they have done? Or no, no. That's what without... I'm saying. Reason it out because you know Hebrews 11 is not just one verse, right? Hebrews 11, there's 40 verses in the chapter. So you took one verse and you ignored the context. If you continue reading in that chapter and you read all the way to the end, it explains to you how God rewards those who seek him. Does it not? Yes. So prophets. what I'm trying to teach you, brother, in Jesus' name, I'm trying to be a teacher to teach you how to interpret the Bible, how not to interpret the Bible, because you're now a babe in the faith. So imagine you're going to school. This is the truth. I'm not saying this to understand. This is what the Bible says. When you're born of the Spirit, you start out as a baby. And then as you pray more and study more, you grow. You go from being a baby to a toddler, to a child, to a teenager, to an adult, a mature man in Christ. So... My question to you is, now you're in kindergarten, let's say. You don't read yes. a verse out of the Bible and then ignore the verses before and after. Because Hebrews 11 verse 6 means there's five verses before it and there are verses after it, from 7 all the way to 40. So if you read the chapter, you're, you're going to answer the question for me. In the chapter, it gives you examples of people who sought God and God then rewarded their faith and blessed them. So what does it mean in the chapter if you see God earnestly? How does God reward you? How does he reward By you? By believing to the in him and seeking the true God. And how does he reward you? What does he do then? It's in the chapter. Then, and don't, don't feel pressure. I'm just trying to teach you. Don't worry about it. It's like, imagine me. I'm a spiritual father. And I'm teaching you, my son. And if you're my son, I'd have a belt. And right now, I'd take you to the room and put you in the corner. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding with you, brother. This is American <laughs> humor. Okay. The chapter tells you how he rewards you. He makes himself known to you and reveals to you the true religion. He doesn't keep you Muslim. He doesn't keep you Hindu. He doesn't keep you Buddhist. That's the point of the chapter. God rewards those who seek him to know who he is. By revealing the, to them the true path to him. He doesn't let you remain in falsehood. You with me there? Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. 
Now I understand. That's the chapter. That's why I'm saying, brother, read the chapter. Abraham is mentioned. Noah is mentioned. These were people that God revealed himself to them. They saw God. God spoke to them. God did miracles through them. Right? And they knew the true God. So that's the point of the chapter. If you see God from your heart and say, God, who are you? I want to know you. I want to know who you are. And I want to know the path to you. Then God will show up and reveal to you the gospel of Jesus Christ. But if you put conditions on God and you say to God, God, Jesus can't be your son. And God, you can't be three in one. Then God says, okay, then you don't want to know me truly. You're not looking for me from all your heart. You want to be convinced of what you already believe. So he'll let you stay in your religion. Okay. Is that clear, Ibn al-Khan? Yes, brother. But can I, I ask? Go ahead. Another... Yes, you can. But before, before you ask him another question, let me encourage you. Change your name to Ibn al either Ibn al-Ab, meaning the son of the father, or Ibn al-Rab, the son of the Lord, or you can even say Ibn al-Masih, the son of the Messiah. Okay. Now, my father actually he named my name Ibn Ul unknowingly. What does it mean? Uh, Ibn El, son of God. Later, I. Okay, brother. What's your other son. question? Go ahead, brother. What's your other uh, question? My other question is about the mark of the beast. Uh huh. Yeah, my. Uh, Be careful. I was reading Revelation like I was confused. Okay, that brother. Can I ask, ask you something before you ask me the question? How long you been in the yes. faith? How long you been in the faith? How long have you been following uh, since Jesus? 2017. So you've been in the faith for less than three years. Why are you reading Revelation? Because I saw a film made by Pastor Stephen Anderson. So yes, I but that's, was interested. But let me, I love you, brother. When you have a baby that can't eat steak or eggs, only milk, are you going to force the baby to eat steak? No. You're going to kill the baby, right? Yeah. Okay, brother. Revelation is is a dinner where you have chicken, turkey, biryani, and you are three months old and you want to eat biryani and chicken, and you wonder why you're confused. Brother, Revelation is the last book you read. That's why it's at the end of the Bible. You're supposed to start from beginning. Pray and ask the Holy Spirit to help you understand the beginning. And as you mature, then you get to the the buffet. Revelation is buffet, like Chinese buffet. Or, yeah, like, yeah, I'm telling you. You you are on milk, you want to go buffet. Of course you're not going to be able to eat. You're going to throw up or die. Okay. So, brother, let me advise you. Praise Jesus Christ that that movie got your attention and the Spirit used it to bring you to faith. Now I'm going to counsel you. Revelation is the last book you read when you come to faith. That's why it's at the end of the Bible, not at the beginning of the Bible. You want to read about the end of the world, but you haven't read how the world began. Genesis, the world begins. Revelation, this world ends, and a new heaven, new earth. You want to get to the end of the world, you haven't even read the beginning of the world. Allahu Akbar, brother. <laughs> Takbir. Right? So my advice to you, because I love you for the sake of Jesus, do not read the Revelation. Don't ask questions about Revelation because it's not of any concern to you. The Revelation that Jesus gave to John, it will be fulfilled the way Jesus intends it to be fulfilled. What Jesus wants you to be worried about is not the mark of the beast, but to know what his will is for your life as a Christian. He wants you to know how to live for him, what to do, what not to do, how to love. Revelation is about the end of this age. You need to start taking baby steps. You just came out of your mother's womb and you want to run a marathon. What happened, yeah, brother. brother? You know I love you, right? Yes, brother. Okay, so it's not I don't want to answer the question. I'm trying to tell you stay away from that book. Focus on the other books. That okay. book comes at the end when you've finished all the books of the Bible You've understood them by the power of the Holy Spirit, and now you're mature in Christ. Okay, all right, now I see. Oh, this is what John meant. Oh, this, oh I, see, right now you're, you're drinking milk, and now I'm stuffing a deep dish pizza down your throat. 
Right? And you're going to get me arrested. They're going to say, look, you're killing a baby. You baby murderer. <laughs> All right? So we have another question. Let's answer another question. Something else if you have another one. Yeah. Um, my another question is, like, what happens? Now, I'm a Christian. I know I'm safe. But what uh-huh. happens if I sin? Like, I have a sin problem going on in my life. Yes. Like, my dad, he wants me to pray the Juma prayer. Uh-huh. He forced me like this and I become very angry. Yeah. So, and that's why I'm saying that. And St. Paul says somewhere in the Bible, I just, uh, he, I can't be angry. The angriness. Yeah. So, Ephesians 4, 26 to 27. So does that angry, mean but if I sin, sin yeah. I go to hell? Like if I'm saved. Okay, bro, let me ask you a question. First of all, when you say he forces you to go to Juma prayer, is it because if you don't go, he'll kill you? Are you living in a country where they can kill you? Yeah, I, I live in okay. a country is beside that, India, Bangladesh. Okay, Bangladesh. So does it mean there's a possibility you can get killed? No, not killing because my family is not that strict, but okay. they force me, but I become angry, so they yeah. escape. Well, it's but, your anger is not... Sinful anger. You're getting angry for the glory of God, the zeal of Jesus, and that's righteous. Meaning, you're getting angry because you know Allah of the Quran is a false god, and this prayer yes. is is a sinful prayer that's not a prayer to the true God, and it's sin against Jesus. So your anger is righteous. The Bible doesn't condemn you when you get angry for the things of God. You with me there? So oh, it's okay, not okay. sin when you get angry for the things of God. You're not getting angry for something selfish. You're getting angry for the glory of Jesus because you love Jesus so much. How dare you have me pray to a false God? Okay. So where is your sin, brother? Where is your sin? You're being zealous for the glory of Jesus. Now to answer your question. Okay, let's answer your question. We all struggle with sins, and some sins are more difficult for us to overcome. And this is going to be our struggle till we die. Two things to remember. As long as you realize it's sin, and you hate it. And secondly, when you do succumb, you cry out to Jesus, say, Jesus, my desire is to love you and to make you happy. But you see, I'm struggling. Lord, have mercy on me, and give me the grace to overcome. But if I'm not to overcome right away, be patient with me, Lord, and have mercy on me, Lord, because I don't want to grieve your heart. And Jesus is more compassionate and loving than you can imagine. And he is only too quick to forgive you because he already knew when he saved you, you're going to sin even after he saved you. So you're not catching Jesus by surprise and shocking him. Okay, so let me give you a verse. Are you ready? Yes. First John chapter 1, verses 7 to 10. First John chapter 1, verses 7 to 10. First John chapter 1, verses 7 to 10. Theistic, leaning, agnostic, read Psalm 38, because it's a psalm about depression. Psalm 38. Read it at your own leisure. Psalm 38. First John 1, 7 to 10. I'm reading this for you, Abdul. I'm going to read it. You ready? Okay. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. So the blood of Jesus washes you. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, Lord, I have sinned. I'm struggling with this sin. And I acknowledge it's sin. And I know it hurts your heart. And I don't want to hurt your heart. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Did you catch it? Yeah. Okay, now... Let me tell you what Jesus told Peter. Are you ready? What Jesus told Peter. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. Matthew 18, 20 to 21. Matthew 18, 20 to 21. Watch here. 
And thank the mods for serving us by posting verses, brother. For where two or three are gathered in, together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So Jesus is in the midst of the body of believers. But now notice what Peter says. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall I shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? So how many times should I forgive him, Lord? Verse 22. Look what Jesus says. Look what he says. Watch here. The Lord is in our midst when we gather together. In order to follow his will, in order to, to worship together as a body. And so then Peter's saying, well, if someone sins against me, how many times should I forgive him? Verse 22, before the rapture, guys. This guy's going to get raptured without knowing what the mark of the beast is. Come on, guys. Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but unto 70 times seven. You know what Jesus said? Not only seven times you forgive him. You forgive him 490 times a day. You know what he means? Why that? 70 times 7? 70 times 7? 490 times a day? If your brother sins 490 times a day and he asks you to forgive him 490 times a day, always forgive him. What Jesus is saying is never limit your willingness to forgive someone who recognizes their sin and confesses. Always be open. Always be ready to forgive someone who knows they have sinned and they're asking for forgiveness. If that's what Jesus says, to us, that if you're my brother and you offend me, but then he say, I'm sorry, I regret what I did, forgive me. And he says, you better forgive him 490 times a day. If he asks for forgiveness 490 times a day, how much more will Jesus forgive you? Infinitely. Okay, so then you got your answer, brother. Okay, did that help you? Yes, brother. Thanks. Now, I want you to leave the buffet today and go back and drink milk, okay? Yes, brother. Because you are in Revelation, it's China, it's Chinese buffet, it's Thai buffet, it's pizza buffet all in one, and you're still drinking milk. Allahu Akbar! All right. You have one more question or you're finished, brother? No, I have these kinds of questions. Okay. Well, if you want to ask me one more for now and then wait in line because others have been calling. So you have one more? Let me take one more. Yeah, I mean, uh, okay, actually, I read the NIV. And uh -huh. I, I hear Pastor Steve Anderson, he's criticizing the NIV. Okay. So should I just stop reading? No, hold on. Let me ask you a question. NIV. How good is your reading in English, your English reading? Do you re is English hard for you to understand or is it easy for you to understand? No, it, it is easy for me to understand. So... The NIV, the level of English, is that's it's very, very easy. Yeah. Have you easy. have you NIV and ESV? Okay. Have you looked at a King James and see if it's hard for you? Yeah, it is very hard. I okay. can barely understand. Okay, then you answered your question. God doesn't want you to get confused because you don't understand what you're reading because you have a hard time with the language. God wants you to understand his message. So if NIV is benefiting you, stick with it for now until you grow in your understanding of the Bible. If ESV is helping you and you understand it, stick with the Bible that helps you understand the Word of God until you reach a level of spiritual maturity understanding so that when you read, the, let's say, the King James, it's not difficult for you. I'd rather have you read a translation you understand that is accurate because NIV is not, it's not, as bad as Steven Anderson makes it out to be. He makes it out to be completely bad. No, that's not true. It's not completely bad. The NIV agrees with the King James Version over 90% of the time. Over 90% of the time, you're getting the same message. Same with the ESV. I am more concerned with you hearing the voice of the Lord who loves you and understanding his voice and what he's telling you than spending your time trying to understand an English translation where you don't understand the beloved's voice to you, what he's trying to tell you. Because the purpose of the Bible is to see how much the beloved, Jesus Christ, loves you and how much he's in love with you. So you, he can melt your heart and take you captive by his love so you can fall in love with him. That's the goal of the Bible. But if you're reading a translation where you can't hear the voice of the beloved and you can't understand how much he loves you, then how are you going to fall in love with him?
and be in awe of his love for you. So don't worry about Steven Anderson. In fact, do me a favor. Not only do I want you to get out of the buffet, get out of Steven Anderson's restaurant. Okay. Steve, because of the coronavirus, Steven Anderson's Shake and Bake restaurant is closed. Okay. Don't listen to him, please, because he's confusing you. Okay? So okay. I'm now going to pass an order that all citizens of Shamunian Chalon, because Shamunian Chalon, Chalon is my state, and you are living in my state. So I'm going to order all of you Shamunians as your governor. Stephen Anderson Shake and Bake, where he shakes people and bakes Bible translations, it's closed for the public. I don't want you to get near that restaurant. Or if you do, I will hunt you down, lay hands on you, and bless you. And then we're going to say Tekbir Budweiser. I'm just kidding. Anyway. <laughs> okay, brothers, so I hope that blessed you. Uh, let's yes, take a couple more calls, and if you have more questions, you can call me back. Okay, brother? Okay, brother. I love you, brother. Thank you. Jesus bless you. Love you. Take care. Ooh. All right. Who's next? That's my... Oh, there it goes. Even before I can say that. What's up, Hacky? Who are you trying to hack, baby? You look Assyrian. Yeah. Hey, hold on one second. Why is it in the picture you had longer hair? Uh... You know, that's a, that's a picture, a bit. Okay, but I'm glad you're going bald like me. Listen, you're fighting. A, <laughs> listen to me, brother. You're fighting a losing battle. Shave it all off. Stop fighting for the few hair follicles on your head. Give it up, man. Okay, what's your question, brother? Just get it. Good. What's your okay. Question? Yeah. Okay, yeah, my chef. First of all, I'm glad to see you. <laughs> I'm your chef. Face Why well, you want to shake and bake me too, huh? Chicken? Good. Yes. Yeah. And I try to get them by uh, some materials to explain Christianity to Muslims in my country. Uh, but I have a, a, let's say, small problem. Muslims can understand the Son of God concept. Yes. They think, you know, this, uh, Allah can't uh, have a son, you know, Why? he doesn't like us, etc. Okay. You want me to answer that yes. question? Yes, yes. Okay. That's a very easy question to answer because i will apply uh, apply the quran against them i'm going to use their logic from the quran so okay mods who can post quran verses for me they're going to post the quran verses in the comment section on the youtube channel so you may want to look at it okay first last god bless you okay first let me repeat the question guys because my brother uh what what's your nationality brother i'm turkish Tur my man you love to eat turkey yes. You are what yes. you eat. Thank <laughs> you. All right. Just kidding. Oh, yeah. But praise God, you are a believer that saved you from being the barbarian that your ancestors were. Okay? No, okay. okay. My ancestors were barbarians too. But glory to Jesus Christ. <laughs> the Lord bless you and preserve you for his glory. Okay. The question he's asking me is this. Muslims say, how can Jesus be the son of God? When God is not like us, he doesn't in engage in sexual intercourse. Because the assumption of the Muslim, the Muslim thinks, the only way for someone to have a son is through sexual intercourse. That's the logic. That's what they're telling him. How Allah is not like us. How can he have a son? All right. I'm going to apply Islamic logic. I'm going to say, are you sure? Are you sure the only way God can have a son is through sex? They have to say no. If they say yes, say, okay, first question. First question. And Lolo already anticipated it. The Blessed Mother of our Lord, when she conceived Jesus, did any man touch her or was she a virgin? She was a virgin. But you know what she said to the Spirit? When the Spirit told her she's going to have a son, in chapter 19, verse 20 of the Quran, and I pray Jesus help me recall all this information, right? Chapter 19, verse 20 of the Quran, Mary tells the Spirit, how can this be, seeing I'm not unchaste? How can I have a son... I, I haven't touched a man. A man hasn't touched me. So she's using Muslim logic. For me to have a son, I have to have a man I have sex with. But then Allah responds in 21, it is easy for Allah. You don't need to have sex to have a son. Okay, but wait, Allah. Mary can have a son without having sex. It's easy, but it's hard for you. You have to have sex to have a son. Okay, that makes sense, Allah. 
You see the problem? The first problem. Yes. Okay. First problem. It is easy for Allah to give Mary a son without sex, without having a husband, without having a boyfriend or a consort. But for some reason, it's no longer easy for Allah. It's too hard for Allah to have a son unless he has sex. That's the first problem, right? Yes. Problem number one. Number two. Number two. The Quran has a mother. Let's go to chapter 43. Chapter 43 of the Quran, verses 3 and 4. Okay. Chapter 43, verses 3 and 4. Yes. The Quran has a mother. Let's watch here. Lo, we have appointed a lecture in Arabic that perhaps you may understand. And Lo, now I don't know why first and last, even though he's my brother from a different mother, he didn't quote a translation that translates the Arabic Umul Kitab as mother of the book. For some reason, he wants to help the Muslims. He wants to help the Ottoman Empire against us. He quotes one that translates the source of decrees. So I think he's suffering from Alzheimer's. Protestant, you're doing okay today. It's first and last that's dropping the ball. First and last, why would you quote a translation that doesn't translate the Arabic correctly? Here, 43 verse 4. And indeed, it is in the mother of the book, Sahih International. See, these guys that help me, this is why I don't pay them nothing for nothing. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, pay attention. 43 verse 4. And indeed, it is in the mother of the book. It says this Quran is in the mother of the book. The Arabic words, um, mother, al-kitab, um al-kitab. So the Quran has a mother. It is in the mother of the book. It comes out of a mother. So I tell the Muslims, I tell the Muslims, since the Quran has a mother, who's the father? Because according to your logic, Allah can't have a son unless he has a wife or a girlfriend. So how can the Quran have a mother without the Quran having a father? And I'm going to give you the answer in a minute, but I want you to see how you set them up. They'll say, no, 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 no. Mother of the book doesn't mean a physical mother has sex, but it still says it's the mother of the book. It's a mother. And I'll tell you who the father is. We're going to look at 43 verse 4 one more time. Chapter 43, verse 4, one more time. Watch here. I'm going to show you who the mother is. Watch here. MashaAllah. It is in the mother of the book with us. The mother is with us. Now, Allah, why is the mother with you? The mother of the Quran. I'll tell you why. The Quran is the word of Allah. Ah, wait. So the Quran has a mother, but the Quran is the word of Allah. That means Allah is the daddy. He's the father. That's why the mother is with him. So Muslims, you just proved your God Allah has a wife. His wife is the mother of the Quran. So that means he produced the Quran from a woman called the mother of the book. Now what are they going to tell you? Here's what they're going to tell you. No, what, what it means is that the Quran came out of the heavenly tablet. It's not the mother... In the sense of a physical woman who gets pregnant from sex and gives birth to someone. The mother means this is the source. The Quran comes from this source. That's what it means by mother. Say thank you. So you just prove Jesus can be the son of God, not in a physical sexual sense. You get it? If you can tell me the mother of the Quran isn't physical sexual. It's spiritual. A spiritual mother. Not a physical sexual mother. Where she had sex with someone, got pregnant, and gave birth to the Quran. Similarly, when we say Jesus, Son of God, we mean spiritually, not physically, sexually, where God had to have sex to have a son. Because you're thinking the only way God can have a son is sexual. No, he can have a son spiritually, without sex, without physical relationship. And your Quran agrees because it says the Quran has a mother. But this mother is not a physical woman who has sex. It is spiritual. Mother meaning the source, the spiritual source from which the Quran comes. You with me there or am I confusing you? No, I'm with you. So that's what you tell the Muslim. If the mother of the Quran is not physical, it's not a physical being that has sex, but it's still the mother, why then do you insist the only way God can be Jesus' father is through sexual physical action? Why can't he be the father spiritually? Meaning that Jesus Christ is from the father. The father is the source of Jesus Christ. See my answer to that? Yes. 
Now, if they, they say, good point, because they're going to have to say, you're right. God can be a father spiritually. He doesn't need to have sex to have Jesus. So that's what you want them to admit. Yes, you're right. Father doesn't mean someone who had sex to have a child. Mother doesn't mean someone had sex to have a child. Because if that's what it means, then the mother of the Quran must have had sex. It must have had sex with Allah because the Quran is the word of Allah. That means the mother of the Quran had sex with Allah to produce the Quran. And they'll say, Astaghfirullah. So you see how you got it? Yes. Okay. Now, let me add another passage for you. Chapter 9, verse 60 of the Quran. Chapter 9, verse 60 I, of the Quran. I have taken notes all of them. Okay. Chapter 9, verse 60. Now watch this. Watch what the Quran says. The, I'm sorry. The alms, okay, this is talking about zakat. When the Muslim gives zakat, who do you give it to? The alms zakat are for the poor. Masakin. The needy, okay, the needy. Those who collect them, those who collect zakat, you give them a portion. Those who hearts are to be reconciled and to free captives and the debtors and for the cause of Allah, those who fight for, for Allah. So you give zakat to the jihadi, to ICE and Al-Qaeda. And then notice this. You also give zakat to the wayfarer. The wayfarer means the traveler. So if you have a Muslim traveling from Arizona to Canada, then you give him money. You help him because he's traveling. Do you know what the Arabic word for wayfarer is? The word traveler in Arabic? Ibn al-Sabil, the son of the road. Ibn, Ibn al-Sabil, the son of the road. Meaning the road is his or her father. Okay, wait. How can the road have a son seeing it has no consort? Or does the road have a consort? Well, maybe the ro road's husband is the car. The road in the car had sex and they produced the child. Maybe the road's husband, because at that time they didn't have cars, right? So the road's husband was the donkeys or the camels, right? Because... If this is the son of the road, and Allah can't have a son unless he has a wife, that means the road can't have a son unless he has a wife. So the donkeys and the camels and all the asses that travel on the road, that's the, the wives of the road. So the road has multiple wives. Yachi. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Okay, now what are they going to tell you? They'll say, Ya Himyar, Ya stupid, Ya stupid. It doesn't mean literally physically the son of the road. Right? Yes, stupid. Okay. What does it mean? It means that this person, because he travels the road so much, he has the characteristics of someone who travels the road. And in that sense, he's the son of the road, not because the road fathered him, but because his life is characterized by traveling. Oh, so son of the road doesn't mean physical sexual. So then why is it when I say Jesus is son of God, Ibn Allah, that has to mean physical and sexual. Why is that? Ya hmm? Himyar, stop it. You get it now? Yes. What did I just prove to, to make this very easy and simple? The Quran agrees the term son of or mother of or father of doesn't always mean physical or sexual. You can use the term father of spiritually. Or metaphorically, you can use the word mother of spiritually, metaphorically, like the Mecca is called the mother of all villages. In the Quran, Mecca is called the mother of all cities. What does that mean that, that Mecca is the mother of all cities? That Mecca had sex with another city to produce all these little cities? No. Okay, so that's what you want the Muslim to see. You can be the father of something or someone, the mother of something or someone, the son or daughter of something or someone. In a spiritual sense, not in a physical, sexual sense. So then, that's good. That's very simple, and that's something they can understand. You got it, Brendan. That's it. And if they then don't get it, you invite me to Turkey, and I will take a turkey leg and smash them in the face and say, "Oh, God!" Okay, you got it. Or I can give you a turkey sword too. <laughs> you got it, my friend. Double edged yes, sword. Any other question? Was that clear? Did I confuse you? That's clear. That's the uh, most important question in my mind. Okay, so you now have, know how to answer, right? Yes. 
Now the final point for you, final point. Say, okay, I'm not going to take the logic of the Quran that someone can't have a child without a consort. Mary had a child. So the only way she can have a child, Jesus, is she have a consort. Who is responsible for getting Mary pregnant? Who got Mary pregnant with Jesus? God by Holy Spirit. You got it. So that means your logic, God has to be the father because you can't have a child without a partner. And God, Allah, was the partner who helped Mary get pregnant even though he didn't have sex with her. But he still got her pregnant by the spirit. So you end up with God being the father of Jesus because he's the partner of Mary who helped Mary conceive a child. Very good, brother. Very good. All right, brother. If you have another question, feel free. If not, then God willing, we'll take more questions. You can take the other questions. Okay. Thank you so much. God brother. bless you. Nice Keep praying for us and Jesus use you mightily. My Turkish brother, like no other, have some turkey co coffee for me. Okay. But don't flip it and then the fortune telling because that's what you guys do. <laughs> you take the kawa and then you flip it and then you look, oh, I see in your future a beautiful wife. She's going to marry you, give you 10 kids. Don't do that, brother. Allah forbid. <laughs> Since my uh, baptism, I'm not involved in prayer. Even Praise my Lord. mother never involved in the uh, fortune Allah telling. Man. That's why we destroy all Turkish cafe. God bless you, brother. God bless you, brother. Take care. Christ is risen. Take care. Take care. Who's next? Have you noticed something about me, folks? For some reason, when I talk to brothers or sisters with accents, I go into an accent mode. And I don't do that deliberately. It's instinctive. For some reason, I start speaking with an accent. Oh, I got issues. No wonder David Wood calls me the rain man of apologetics. Anyone else with a question? What happened, Mickey? You had a question you're calling? What's up? Somebody calling? I will surely follow, ma'am, two for one. Yeah, go ahead, ma'am. Call me. Somebody call me. You, of course you call me. It's my number. Yeah, I don't know, man. I, 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 that's something I picked up over the years where... When I speak with someone accent, I start speaking with an accent. And it's not to make fun of them. All right. What's happening? What's hey. B, what's up? Um, my name is Jacob. My I'm man, look nice at them shades, now. baby. I've been watching your videos for quite some time, and um, I enjoy your content very much. I don't know. I think you're setting me up. Why are you running um, out of the house? So are you ready quarantine? for the question? No, why are you running out of the house? You're supposed to be quarantined. You're supposed to stay inside. Wait, wait, hold on one second. Can you hear me? I want to see if there's a... Can I, can I put you on speaker in any way? I don't know. Can you? I'm waiting for you to hear me. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. You know what? Wait, is there something? What happened? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, right. perfect. I like the shape, right. man. CQ, Christian quality. What's the question if I can answer by the grace of God? Okay, so... Um, so basically, uh, I just want to, I kind of want to confess here. I, I know that many other people are listening. So I, I just want to make a, a small thing. It's not that I believe that I'm, you know, I'm a particular person, but I believe that God has a huge connection with me. Okay. And, and that he's been showing me signs. Uh, so when I believe that he was showing me signs, I looked into Islam. I don't believe that Islam is true whatsoever because of the things that yeah. uh, was revealed to me by you and David Wood and many others. Right. But the, my problem is, is that although I don't believe in Allah, um, you mentioned that the God of, of the Islam is yes. Bayah. Baal. Now, Baal. Baal, yeah. yeah. So I'm not, I'm not a, a linguist. And, uh, mm -hmm. But I do know that if this is the God uh, Baal yes. or Moloch or, or whomever it may be, mm -hmm. Um, is it possible that he can actually respond? Because if yes, he, can, he can, I I've actually been receiving supernatural responses from, from some spirit who claims to be Allah. Yeah. And that's why I have a problem with it because I know God, I've heard his voice. Mm -hmm. I've seen Jesus Christ, you know, in, in a vision, mm -hmm. uh, he hugged me. I know God is real. I know Jesus died on the cross, Okay, but the fact that it's God uh, Allah is is kind of like making himself seem real to me. Sure. It kind of scares me because most of the Christians in the world don't believe that Allah is a real being at all. They believe that he was made up, that he is some fictional character just brainwashing the people. But what I believe is, is that 
Allah is 100% a real supernatural being. Yes. But I don't know. I don't know if he's the devil in disguise yeah. or if he's just being misrepresented by Muhammad, you know, and, and he's actually yeah. like God Almighty, but he's being re- misrepresented by Muhammad and, the, you know, the Islam. Okay, let, let me, let me, let me get back. Let me ask you this Allah that's talking to you. What is he telling you about yeah. Jesus? You know what? I haven't, I haven't, I've asked him about Jesus. And what he said, but I haven't got. Okay. I, I'll tell you. I'll tell you exactly what what happened. Um, yeah. It, when I was looking into Islam, maybe two or three years ago, I had one night was outside, and I only read the first chapter of of the Quran. Yeah, so After I read the chapter Al Nur, Al, Al Nur, oh, I didn't. Uh, I didn't agree with it because of the Book of John, chapter eight, verse one through eleven. But yeah, I did funny. agree with. Uh, with the first chapter, which said, you know, God created all things, you know, love and glory and peace be to him. Yeah. So that night after I heard it, I looked outside yeah. and I was looking at the stars and I said to I said to God, I said, God, is the Quran good? Mm-hmm. And I heard a voice in me say, do you do you believe the Quran is good? And I said, yes. Because I didn't know the Quran at the time. Mm-hmm. I only read the first chapter. And I said, yes. Mm-hmm. And then I heard a voice say within me, then it is good. And I saw a shooting star go across the sky. And then I said, Allah, is the Quran true? And he said, do you believe the Quran is true? And I said, yes. Mm-hmm. And I saw another shooting star. And he said, then it is true. Mm-hmm. And the next morning when I woke up, a surah called Surah Al-Jinn popped up uh, on my notifications, which I- I'm not going to recite it. Yeah, I know. But shooting it, stars. I get the point. Yeah. So, what did you get? You get from, yeah. So what weird. did you get from reading Surah Al Jinn, chapter seventy-two? What did you get from it? Okay, so many Muslims believe that what it's saying there is that uh, people are claiming that the jinn were going up into the heavens and that Allah yeah. shoots them down with shooting stars because they listen. But from what I got from that yeah. was that the jinn speaking and the Jinn were saying that they go up to heaven and that if you want and that the men, if they want answers from God, instead of going up to heaven and listening like we were, that you should look to the stars and ask God questions for heavenly secrets. Now be, and when I, my I, friend, I hold like, on, hold on. Is that so come, on, come on, take a breath, breathe, stop walking because you're, you're getting tired. Pause. Oh, no, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, not, I'm really not really concerned with your interpretation or the Muslim interpretation. Uh, you got what you asked for. You told the voice, the Quran is true, so he gave you the desires of your heart. And so you're That's deceived I- because if the voice told me, is the Quran good? I'll say no. Why? Because it contradicts the gospel of Jesus Christ. So you got yeah. exactly what you asked for. You said it's good. Yeah. Okay, then it's good. So you got... But you have you heard this uh, the show you asked for it? You asked for it. So this is not a voice from God. It is either your own voice that you think it's a voice external to you, or it's a demonic voice, or even if you want to say it's it's the voice of God. Let's just say, for argument's sake, God is giving you uh, what you want because you were asked, Do you believe it's good? You go, Yes. And you, you talk to Allah, then you cried out to Allah. Instead of saying, Jesus, is the Quran good? You spoke to some deity out there. God, God is generic. Most there are people who worship Satan as yeah. God. They worship their their appetites as God. They were so when you said God, and then you went specific. You said Allah. Interestingly, in your prayer, Jesus didn't come up. So then, why are you shocked that you got the answer that you wanted? Because when you're asked, you said the Quran is good. Okay, it's good. Go ahead. So my point is, stay away from yeah. these voices. Stay away from these voices. Stay away from from supernatural yeah. encounters because it seems like your entire faith is based on signs and wonders. Signs and wonders are no indication of the truth. Listen to me, though. I want you to hear me. Instead of talking, listen, because it's time for you to listen now. Signs and wonders are proof of nothing. They're only simply proof that there is a spirit realm that exists and that there are spirit beings who will produce signs and wonders to deceive you from the truth. But because God is almighty, if you sincerely seek him, and this goes back to the question of Ibn al-Khan, you will seek me and you'll find me if you seek me with all your heart. That's Jeremiah 29, 13, although he mentioned Hebrews eleven six, 6. God rewards those who earnestly seek him and desire to know him as he is, 
But once you put conditions on God, well, God, yeah, I believe the crown is true. All right, it's true. Then go ahead. Give you over to the desires of your heart. So your signs and wonders don't impress me because it can be satanic in origin. What impresses me is yeah. someone coming to the Bible, taking the Bible for what it says, and using the Bible as the filter to test all signs, all wonders, all spirits. Because I'm going to give you some verses now, and I want you to listen to the verses and meditate on the verses. Deuteronomy 13, verses 1 to 5. Deuteronomy 13, verses 1 to 5. 105. Kimberly, I didn't ask you if you agree or disagree. I could care less for your opinion because you didn't listen, Kimberly. Let me try this again, Kimberly. Did you did you hear me say there are no signs, or did you hear me say signs and wonders mean nothing if they go against God's word? So don't disagree with something that you don't know what you're disagreeing with. Okay, Kimberly? No, I don't, not I, you, man. Calm down. Oh, hey. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to on, Kimberly. Listen. Both of you listen. My, this is time. My phone up. Give me one second, okay. please. Deuteronomy 13, verses 1 to 5. Kimberly is primed to be deceived because if she puts her hope on signs, there she goes. For those of you who are listening, ears to, hear, ears to hear and eyes to see. Deuteronomy 13, verses 1 to 5. Okay, watch here. Listen, I want I want you guys to listen. I wasn't talking to you, brother. I was talking to someone in the chat named Kimberly who thought she understood what no, I was saying and disagreeing with something <laughs> she had no reason to disagree with. Now, Deuteronomy 13, verses 1 to 5. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, sign or a wonder, what you ask for, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, so the sign and wonder happens, it takes place. Wherefore he spake yeah. unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Now notice what God says. Notice what God says. Okay, yeah. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams like you, dreaming dreams. Seeing visions yeah. and signs. For the Lord Jehovah your God proveth you, tests you, to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God, Jehovah your God, Yahweh your God, and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. And you shall serve him and cleave unto him. And then verse 5. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put uh -huh. to death. Because he has yeah. spoken to turn you away from the Lord, Yahovah, your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemeth you out of the house of bondage and to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord, Jehovah, thy God, commandeth thee to walk in. So shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. So the Bible already anticipated this. A sign, a wonder, a miracle yeah. that leads you away from the God of truth. And his truth is in the Bible. So that's the only advice I can give you. Turn away from your signs and wonders and embrace Jesus. So, um, you know, I do. I very much like that you that you read that because um, yeah. I have read that before. And I, that's exactly what I was thinking of when I had received those signs that I should be afraid because. Uh, God Almighty, you know, he commanded that, that those people who lead us away from God, yep. that they're to be put to death because, you know, they're they're liars. They're they're uh, they're trying to lead you away from God towards the devil or other unclean spirits. Um, and I wanted to say that when I when I prayed to God, I asked him, I said, Lord, you know, what do I do when I receive supernatural signs? Because I was surprised to receive an actual supernatural sign. And what was that his answer was to you? Completely what, did, what did God answer you in your own and, mind? Uh, what do you think he said? Quickly, brother. What do you think God told you? Because you said, what do I do with signs and wonders? What was oh. his answer in your mind? Because you believe God is talking to you in an audible way. What was his it's answer? A, uh, it was a, you know, the Bible, there's a Bible app called KJV Bible app. Yes. And it gives you a verse of the day. Oh. And the verse of the day, I forget what book it was, but it said that if any sign or if anything comes to you that does not, uh, that does not testify with the word, with yes. Jesus Christ, and it is a false sign. It was in the New okay. Testament, and I wish I knew it. You got Matthew but, 24, but was, Matthew 24, uh, verses 23 to 25, where Jesus talks about false Christ and false prophets doing signs and wonders to deceive, if it were possible, even the elect. Then you got 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. Let's look at 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. So you got your answer, brother. You stay away from these signs and wonders. Be anchored in the Bible, study the Bible, believe the Bible, live out the yeah. Bible, and don't put too much trust in your signs and wonders because you're going to get carried away with signs and wonders and be destroyed and consumed. Go with that which is certain and established, the Holy Bible. But here, let me read 1 John 4, verses 1 to 6. 1 John 4. 
Okay. Four versus one of six. You got to – dude, do me a favor. Stop walking. You're not in a marathon. Go somewhere. Stand in one place so we don't hear the background noise, and I can read this for you. Okay? For John four versus uh, one of was... six. You're going to keep walking there? Now. Okay. You're going to stop? I'm going to give you 10 seconds to stop. Ten. I'm never going to stop walking. That's I've been doing that since I was born. <laughs> no. Uh, to answer the question, do you want to stop right there for a minute and read it? Then you can start walking, brother. So I can read the verse. First John um, 4. Oh, yeah, okay, now listen. I was trying to say that, um, that I can't actually. He'll hear it over here. Let me read it for him out loud. First John 4, verses 1 to 6. Brother, you can listen in to the answer. Here's the answer, guys. First John 4, verses 1 to 6. Okay, First John 4, verses 1 to 6. Mickey, go ahead, call, brother. Okay, call me, bro. They say our love, don't pay the rent. Now this guy's going to be a thorn. He won't stop calling, you see? Oh, my guys. This is where we come with the block. Go ahead, Mickey. Mickey, is that you? Yo, there. You there, Mick? You hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now, brother. Yeah, all right. What's God up, bro? You. God bless you, sir. Finally. It took my call. You know, I don't know. Uh, I have just one quick question. I don't know if anybody Hey, guys, can you get uh, Kim, Kim, uh, Kimberly out of here? B block her from my page. Don't let her come back again. Go ahead, brother. Yeah. What's the issue with Noah's son seeing him naked? Everybody's saying something else about it, and I, 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 I can't really understand. Okay. Okay. Uh, Post for me Leviticus 18, verse 8, and Leviticus 20, verse 11. Leviticus 18, verse 8, and Leviticus 20, verse 11. Let's first read what the Bible says, as the Lord enables me to recall passages. Kevin, you want to leave too, brother? Make my day, Kevin. Increase my block list. Just say something. Say something else, Kevin, because I want to send you on your merry way too. Leviticus 18, verse 8. The nakedness of thy father's wife shalt thou not uncover. It is thy father's nakedness. Leviticus 18.8, Protestant brother, it's you know it's kicking in now, right? Your Alzheimer's kicking in. I didn't think I said 18.11, I said 20.11. Protestant, I'm really concerned. It's getting worse every day. What can I do to help you, brother? Me and Mickey, we're going to be committed to helping you. What do we need to help you? You're really damaged. It's irreparable. Leviticus 20, verse 11. Leviticus 20, verse 11. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I know, man. He's making Joe Biden look healthy. And the man that lieth with his father's wife hath uncovered his father's nakedness. Are you paying attention, Mickey? Leviticus 18, verse 8, and Leviticus 20, verse 11 explains what it means to uncover your father's nakedness. And the man that lieth with his father's wife hath uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. So you understand okay. what it means in the language of the Torah, the Torah of Moses, to expose someone's nakedness. Guys, are you paying attention to the question? The question is, what did what did Ham do when it says he saw his father's nakedness and didn't cover it up, but went and aired it and advertised it, where his brothers did cover their father's nakedness? In the language of Moses, in the language of the Torah, because remember who's writing Genesis 9? Moses. And he's writing this after the fact as part of the Torah that God is inspiring him by the Spirit to write in the desert, which means that you... Pay attention now. I want everyone to get this, not just Mickey. I want everyone to understand that Genesis is to be understood in the context of the commandments, the injunctions, the statutes that Moses later received. So that means when he says nakedness in Genesis 9, later on in the Torah, he then explains and defines what nakedness is. So in light of that, Mickey and everyone else, if Moses has told the Israelites Exposing your father's nakedness means sleeping with his wife. That's how you expose your father's nakedness. And then you go back and read Genesis 9. Ham saw his father's nakedness. What does that mean? I think that means that uh, he slept with Noah's wife. His mother. He committed incest. Okay. Okay. Let me add to that, Mickey, before you, you we go any further. Yeah. Why do you think... Noah ends up cursing Canaan, the son of Ham, but not Ham. 
He's tired. Who's tired? I don't know what he's talking about. Why do you think Noah <clears throat> cursed Canaan but not Ham? Ham was the one who committed the sin. But why is he cursing Canaan? Yes, I do, I Lola. If you have a question. question. Lola, if you have a question in text, I'll answer. Yes. Guys, I want you to engage as well. When someone asks me a question, it's for all of you to benefit all of you. As the Holy Spirit guides me to speak truth without error, and we're trusting the Spirit to save me from any mistakes. And this is not my interpretation. I didn't come up with it. So don't say, Sam, you can't. This has been an interpretation held by Christians historically. Okay. Because Canaan is the bastard child. Someone got it. Jonathan Simon got it. Genesis 9 is telescoping. Guys, let me explain a literary feature of the Bible. And please let me know if you're getting it, if you're confused. Sorry, Kevin. Brother Kevin, forgive me. I love you, my brother in Jesus, because your comment came right after my interaction with Kimberly, and I thought I offended you. So sorry, bro. Forgive me for the sake of the Lord. Remember, 70 times 7. That means I have now 489 more times to offend you, and you better forgive me. 489 more times, Kevin. And just because you think you're fit doesn't make you cool. But coming back to the issue, by the grace of Jesus Christ, coming back to the issue. The reason why Noah's cursing Canaan is because Canaan is the bastard child of that incestuous union where Ham dishonored his mother and father. And something that is true of the Bible, you guys got to remember this. There is a feature called telescoping. Telescoping means that a writer will condense events that took a period of time into one single event, giving the impression that all of this is taking place in the same day, at the same moment. Everyone with me there? I don't know what you mean you're not sure about this, Louisa. I don't understand. If you're just coming in, what's there not to be sure of? It says he uncovered his father's nakedness in the light of Moses' own words. Leviticus 18.8 8 and 2011, please show me that, uh, that nakedness means something other than how Moses explained it, who's the very author of Genesis 9. So I don't know what's to be unsure of. If you, if you can't allow the Bible to discuss and record the sins of people, then I'm not sure that David committed adultery and murdered the man to cover up his sin. I'm not sure that Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines and then worship their gods and goddesses and sacrifice to their gods and goddesses. See, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure about Samson in Judges 16 looking for a whore in Gaza and then sleeping with her. I'm not sure about Judah, the son of Jacob, sleeping with whom he thought was a prostitute in a whore and getting her pregnant and turned out to be his daughter-in-law. See, I'm not sure about these things, Louisa. Because, see, human beings are much better than we think in the Bible only presents humans who are outstanding in their moral qualities. What's there not to be sure about? You get my point? What's there not to be sure about? The Bible is an accurate, honest record of the moral failures of even the characters that feature prominently in the narratives. What's there not to be, what's there not to be sure about? You actually think... These people were better than they are. Why do you think that, Louisa? The Bible is not about exalting man. It's about exalting God and showing us that even the best of saints can be the worst of sinners apart from the grace of Jesus Christ. Exactly, Candace. You gave me another one. I'm not sure, Louisa, in Genesis 19, that Lot had sex with his daughters and sired his own grandchildren who turned out to be his own sons. See, I'm not sure about that, Louisa. So why would I then think that the Bible would suggest that Ham slept with his mother, got her pregnant. I'm not sure about that because the Bible doesn't record the moral failures of the characters in the stories. What's there not to be sure about? Because that shows that the brothers honored their father by not defiling their mother. That's the point of the text, Louisa. They came in backward, meaning they covered their father's shame by not defiling their mother like their brother did. That's all it's saying, Louisa. But you didn't address the point, though. What does exposing your father's nakedness mean in light of the very author who wrote that? See? Let's try it again. What does it mean in light of Moses' own 
explanation of that phrase because Moses wrote Genesis and he wrote Leviticus 18 and 20. And to further connect it, let me make a further connection. When you read Leviticus 18 and 20 carefully, Moses is telling them, be careful that you don't do these things because this is what the Canaanites do. Who uncovers his father's nakedness? The Canaanite. Who are the Canaanites? The son of Canaan, the son of Ham. Gee, is there a connection with Canaan's descendants performing incestuous acts with their ancestor doing the same? Could there be a connection? I wonder. Are you with me there? Are you with me there? It makes even much more sense. Notice the connection. The Canaanites are performing incestuous acts. A father sleeps with his daughter. A mother sleeps with her son. A son sleeps with his father's wife. Canaanites are doing this. And the language used to express that, exposing one another's nakedness. Could there then be a connection with Canaan, the son of Ham, who exposed his father's nakedness, and Canaan's descendants? carrying the same practices that they received from their progenitor? Could that be a possibility? Okay, but now, did you get your answer, Mickey? Did you have a follow-up? Uh, yeah, no, no, it's okay. I think that that's it. That's all of what I wanted to say. Just one thing. Uh, I hope and pray that God willing... You two little ones are going to be with you together again God bless because you, I feel sad for you. And I have a little daughter myself. I can't imagine Hallelujah. without you, without her again. The Lord Amen. Jesus bless you, your family, your angel, that she turns out to be a warrior, a princess of Jesus. And I pray he does that for my daughters. And brother, this answer also now makes sense. Why? Why? Noah would curse Canaan. Because now yes. Lisa and others who don't see it this way, can you explain to me why Canaan was cursed by Noah? Canaan, who did nothing? Canaan was the son of Ham. Why curse him? Yeah, only in light of that, it would make sense. Thank yes. you. Because he's the bastard child. And so I'm saying, because of this, this is what's going to happen. Because this child is the fruit of sin. Otherwise, why curse Canaan? What did Canaan? Hey, no, what's wrong with you, man? You bless Shem and you bless Jephthah, but then you curse Canaan, not Ham. He's the one who exposed your, your nakedness. Why curse Canaan? Notice it goes from cursing Canaan and then blessing Shem and Jephthah and their descendants. Why then curse Canaan if Canaan isn't somehow involved in Ham's sin of exposing his father's nakedness? Things to make you go, hmm. But I hope that answered it, brother. Thank you for an excellent question. Yes. Jesus is Lord, and may he bless us and anoint us and save us from error and sin. I love you, man. Amen. I love you too. I love you all. God bless you. Take care. God bless you. Okay, how many? How much time has this been? It's been what? How long have I been doing the Q&A? Good questions, by the way. And I hope my, my answers are challenging you. But one thing, don't tell me. Don't tell me you're not sure. And tell me it's foreign. And I say this in love for my sister Lisa and the rest of you. The Muslims tell me that all the time. Uh, I'm not sure about the Trinity. That sounds alien and foreign. I'm not sure about God being born as a baby. So you notice what you're doing again? You're imposing your finite, imperfect thoughts upon what the Bible can and cannot say. If you go this route, you're going to reject many core doctrines of the Christian faith because it doesn't make sense. And I'm not really sure about it. And it seems foreign. That's not the way to interpret scripture. Right? Stephen Universe, what's your, by the way, how much time has elapsed? Because remember, I want to do two other sessions, God willing. How much time has elapsed? I don't see the time here. 80 minutes? Okay. Let's do another maybe 10 minutes of Q&A, God willing. And then within an hour, I'm going to do a session on Jesus, the God of the patriarchs and the prophets. What's the question, Stephen? Universe. The universe is yours, my friend. Okay. What's the question? Ask it in the text and I'll read it out loud. Amen. In Jesus' name. Truth will set you free. I like that. <laughs> I like that, man. Okay. That's right. This is Shamunian, Pennsylvania, baby. All right. I'm trying to look for Stephen Universe's question. Even though it's your universe, this is my state, Stephen. Your universe, my state. So I'm a state within your universe. 
Okay, that's your specific question. Okay, let's look at Isaiah 43, verse 10. Isaiah 43, verse 10. Let's look at it. And here's some articles for you, Stephen. Here's some articles for you. Smart one. All right. Save these articles, okay? And guys, when I'm answering one question, don't call me. Let me finish the question and then call me because I don't want to keep hanging up on you. Stephen, this is part one. Save that article, part one. Guys, save that article. This is a must-read article for every one of you. Okay. Here's part two. Here's part two. Part two. Save these articles. Click on the links, two articles. Save them, study them, because it shows you how biblical language works and how biblical language does not work. So now, Stephen Universe is wondering, does Isaiah 43 verse 10 refute henotheism? The notion that there's one supreme God and a host of lesser gods that he created. Let's look at the verse one more time. Thank you, Isaac. I try to make them very easy and simple with lots of meat so you can digest. Isaiah 43, verse 10. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord Jehovah, Yehovah, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be be after me so Stephen is wondering isn't this plain as day there is no other God besides Yehovah Jehovah there is no other God alongside Jehovah no God exists before him no God after him isn't that plain as day wouldn't this settle the problem there can't be any other God of any other kind besides Yahweh Yehovah Jehovah no this doesn't prove it can you understand what his question is his question is, would it disprove there can't be other gods? No, it, it can't. Guys, focus and don't let people get you into side issues and tangents because I want you to learn from the questions. Even though it may not be your question, you will still learn and be sharpened because these questions are addressing a variety of topics that we all need to be well-versed in for the glory of Jesus Christ. And we're trusting the Spirit to give us the correct answers because truth comes from him. Okay, now focus. The Bible will often use language such as no one, only one, and one without excluding others. Are you with me there? Stephen, I want you to listen to me. In the two articles I gave you, the two articles I gave you, I give you examples where the Bible will use language such as one and only, one, None else, no other. And yet there will be others who also share in a specific function or characteristic that the Bible says belong to only one entity. For example, the Bible says in Mark 10, 18, there's none good but God. Only God is good, right? Only God is good. Okay, but now that's Mark 10, 18. And the Greek word is agathos. In the article that I gave you, However, there are many other people who are good. Here, let me quote it for you. Look, Stephen. Mark 10, 18, only God is good. Agathos is the word. Okay, but hold on. Luke 23, 50. Now, there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea, who was a member of the council, a good and righteous man, Agathos. We have a contradiction, Stephen. Only God is good, but so is Joseph. Either Joseph is God, or we have a contradiction, or there's a third option. Either Joseph is God, or we have a contradiction, or there's a third option. And what's the third option? The third option is when the Bible says that God is the only one who's good, it means he's good in such a way that doesn't apply to others who can be good, but not in the same sense that God is. Let me repeat it again. You can have someone who's good, but not in the sense that God is. God is good in a sense in which others are excluded. Only God is good in this particular sense. Others are good in a relative sense, but not in the same sense that God is. You see how the Bible works? You see the biblical language? But wait, it says only God is good. No one else. No. Joseph is good. Now let me give you other examples from my articles. This is why I keep encouraging you guys. I keep encouraging guys Study the materials, not because I want to be famous and you guys look at me as 
God's gift apologetics? No, because these arguments we've addressed thoroughly in our articles, rebuttals, and sessions. Study them, eat them up, disseminate them, share them for the glory of Christ. Here's another example. Barnabas in Acts 11, 22 to 24. I'm not going to read, quote all of it. Acts 11, 22 to 24. Stephen, notice this. Acts 11, 22 to 24. Watch this, Stephen. For he was a good man. Barnabas was a good man. Agathos, filled with the Holy Spirit and faith. Hold on. Wait, 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 Luke. Wait, wait, Luke. You just said in your own gospel, Luke 18, verse 19, that Jesus said only God is good. Didn't you say that, Luke? Yeah. I, 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 I wrote that, Luke 18, 19. But then you said Joseph and Barnabas, they're good. So, Luke, either that means Joseph and Barnabas are members of the Godhead, or you're contradicting yourself, or there's a third option. There's a third option. What's the third option? Yes, God alone is good in that sense of goodness. Others are good in a relative sense. Now, I can multiply examples, but did you save the links to my articles? Did you save the links to my articles? Because if you did, then I can skip giving you further examples, and I can just get to the meat of the point. All right, what's the point? A henotheist will tell you, yes, there is no other God besides Yahweh, Jehovah, in the sense in which Jehovah is God. In other words, Jehovah is the only God of that kind. Jehovah is a specific kind of God. There is no other God like that kind of God. That's all it's saying. You get my point? Jehovah is a specific, particular, special kind of deity. There is no other deity like Jehovah. So these other gods, they're not like Jehovah. So yes, there is no God like Jehovah. There is no other God that is God in the same sense that Jehovah is. That's what they'll tell you Isaiah 43, 10 is saying. Are you with me there? So let's say that doesn't prove your point. That doesn't prove your point. You get what I'm saying? But I will give you a passage that shows no other kind of God exists in any sense. There is no other kind of God. There's only one God. There are no lesser gods because no other kind of God exists at all. I'll give you a verse for that. Are you ready? I can give you a verse. Galatians 4, verse 8, Stephen Universe. Galatians 4, verse 8. Guys, we're up to like 175. Praise God. We're increasing. I hope you come back for the second session. In an hour from now, God willing, I'm going to do Jesus, the God of the patriarchs and the prophets, and that's me. You got to come. If you can make it come and invite people, Lord willing, because we're going to do marathon sessions today, at least three, if God is pleased. Galatians 4, verse 8, Stephen. This is for you. Galatians 4, verse 8. Howbeit then, when you knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. Pay attention, Stephen. Paul is talking to Gentiles who were enslaved by the powers and principalities of the heavenly realms that deceived them into thinking they were the gods and goddesses worshipped by the nations. In other words, these would be the very gods that Michael Heiser claims are the gods of the council, these spirit rulers who enslaved the nations as part of God's judgment upon them, these spirit rulers who appeared as the gods and goddesses of the nations like Zeus and, and Baal, and these people were enslaved to them and served them, but now God has set them free. But you understand what Paul said about those gods? They are not gods at all. They were no gods by nature. They were not gods at all. They did not have divine nature, even in a lesser sense. You serve those who by nature were not gods. They were not gods at all. Not that they were not gods in the way Jehovah's God. They're not gods, period. No, see, Stephen, you're not listening, man. Stephen, I'm going to throw you in the lion's den so they can eat you up. You just set yourself up for refutation. So you didn't hear me. Can you show me where it says idols? Stephen, why are you making it harder for you and me? Stephen, I will be, I'll take Shahada with Ibn al-Khan if you show me where it mentions idols in Galatians 4.8. 
Why are you adding to the text and making it harder for you, brother? Did I waste my time answering the question, brother? Let me know. Because notice you're saying they're not gods. Stephen, for the love of the Lord. The Bible says behind the idols are demons. So you just set yourself up to be refuted by Mike Kaiser and others. Mike Kaiser said, exactly, the idols are not gods, but the demons are that are behind them. So why are you setting yourself up to be refuted when I'm trying to help you not be refuted? This is what happens when you pontificate, brethren, like Stephen did with good intention. He's a good brother, but see, no, they're idols. I'm going to let Mike Heiser decimate you because I'm trying to help you, but you're not following me. Okay, Stephen, let's try this again. You just fell for the trap of the henotheist. Exactly. The idols were not gods, and that's what Paul is condemning. But he says nothing about the demons behind them. He doesn't deny those demons are gods. 1 Corinthians 10 2. 10 20. I'm sorry, not 10 2. Stephen, don't make it harder for you and me and listen. I'll give you 10 million bucks where Paul says in Galatians 4 8, he's referring to the idols. He's not referring to the idols. He's referring to the elemental spirits that had enslaved them. Nothing to do with idols. Can you send Isaiah out of here? Send him to Mecca to preach. Maybe he gets martyred for Jesus. Get him out of here. Okay. And Henotheist wants you to say it's referring to idols because he now will set you up. Exactly, Stephen. The idols are nothing. And that's what Paul is saying. You worshiped idols and the idols are nothing. But Paul did not say the demons attached to the idols are nothing. Because in 1 Corinthians 10 20, he says that they sacrifice to devils. So even though the idols nothing, when you sacrifice an idol, you're being attached to a demon. So the demon is something is real. So you just prove they are gods. The idols are not gods, but the spirit beings behind them are gods. You see what you did, Stephen? So go with that thinking, and you have no case against henotheism. So Stephen, embrace henotheism. Are you going to listen? And now show me where in Galatians 4.8... It mentions, it mentions idols. Let's go to Galatians 4, verses 8 to 13. Trust the Holy Spirit to enable and recall this information. Let's read it. Galatians 4, verses 8 to 13. I'm trying to help you make the best case to show henotheism does not exist because these gods are not gods at all. They're falsely viewed as gods. Or they're gods in a functional sense, but they are not divine in nature. In the sense that they are lesser gods, gods of a different sort. I'm trying to help you, but I can't help you if you're going to say, hey, the idol's nothing. You just argued the way Mike Heiser argued. So you are a henotheist. Galatians 4, 10 to 13. Okay. Galatians 4, 10 to 13. What happened to my guys? I'm sorry. Galatians 4, 8 to 13. You guys checked out? First and last, brought us and let me know so I can start reading. Galatians 4, 8 to 13. Let's read. How be it then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how ye turn again to the weak and beggarly elements, elements, elemental spirits, want to ye desire again to be in bondage. Ye observe days and months and times and years. I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you Labor in vain. I wasted my time with you. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. You have not injured me at all. You know how, through the infirmity of the flesh, I preach the gospel unto you at the first. Now notice, Galatians 4.9, posted in the ESV. What are these elements that he's referring to, or NIV? These are the elemental spirits, meaning the spirits that control and influence the nations. Did you catch it? Galatians 4, 9. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world? Those are the gods he's referring to, not the idols. The principles of the world. The elementary spirits that influence the world, that permeate the world. 
influence them to corrupt themselves and rebel against God. Those are the ones that are not gods. It's not referring to idols, but the spirits, the principalities that influence nations to defy God, to sin, to war against each other, to hate, to steal, to murder, to spread corruption. They are no gods by nature. So if there are no gods by nature, but these are the gods that rule over the nations, that means this heavenly council where the sons of God rule over the nations, they are no gods at all. They are by nature no gods. So much for henotheism. You get my point now? I'm trying to make it easy for you to refute henotheism. Now, for the record, if henotheism is biblical, I'll accept it. If the Bible teaches it, amen. But because of Galatians 4.8, I cannot accept that these gods are lesser gods in nature. They do possess the nature of divinity. Because Galatians 4.8 is not about the idols, about the principalities, the elements, meaning the spirits permeating the nations, corrupting the nations, enslaving the nations. He says those spirits, these principles, principalities, elementary spirits, they are not gods at all. They are by nature no gods at all. End of story. Candace, you got to go back to my series on that. Go back. I did a couple of series on that. Excellent questions, guys. We're up to 175. God bless you. The Lord Jesus, shine his face on you and your loved ones. Shine his face on me and my loved ones. Cover us by the blood of the Lamb. Seal us by the Spirit. Thank you for your patience and showing me <laughs> grace and putting up with me. I'm a work in progress. You're blessing me as I'm blessing you, right? And hopefully you learned a lot. So Lord willing, it's 4.08 my time. I'm going to come back 5.30 p.m. my time, which is 8.30 p.m. New York time, Eastern Standard Time. So an hour and 21 minutes from now, God willing, I'm doing another session. Jesus, the God of the patriarchs and the prophets. I want to see the numbers higher. Invite people, more people to hear this. I'm going to give you evidence from John that... Jesus is the God of the patriarchs and the prophets, according to John's gospel. You got a foretaste of it yesterday in my debate, but because of time limits, I couldn't go in depth. In Jesus' name, may he bless the second session, anoint me to speak clearly without error, and bless you so you can be in awe of the God of the Bible, who is the God who lives, who is the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus willing, see you at 5.30 p.m., which is 7.30, I'm sorry, 8.30 p.m. New York time, Eastern Standard Time. Less than an hour and a half. Christ is risen, risen indeed.